welcome all of you to the first Tel Aviv University Summer School on <clears throat> Nanomedicine and Innovation. On behalf of everyone that was involved in this summer school, starting from those that had the vision for it, all the organizers, my colleagues, the teachers, um, we hope that this summer school will be interesting and challenging, and most important, that you'll have fun. Now, most of the lectures you'll be hearing will bring before you a complete scientific study. And in that I mean, they'll start with telling you the motivation for embarking on the study, um, objectives, a strategy to, re to uh, acquire the objectives, and uh, results, interpretation of results, conclusions, and so forth. Since this is an introductory lecture, I'll do something different. I'll start with a peek into global view of nanomedicine, some basic concepts and principles. I uh, will spend a big chunk of the time on drug targeting self and more so carrier mediated. I'll support it by examples from scientific studies, just not a whole scientific story from start to end. And along the way, we'll have the opportunity to re-examine some dogmas in the field, some myths, and some terminology. And before I get into the nano and so forth, I'd like to acknowledge and give credit to the people from whose studies I have taken the examples. It includes uh, studies done by former members of my lab, Dan, that you've just met, Dina and Noga, current members of my lab in Barifat and Ilya, and some of the examples will be from a collaboration my lab has with the uh, lab of Professor Lior at the Faculty of Medicine in Sheba Medical Center, and the members of his, his group that participated in it are Tami, Natalie, and Atka. So let's start with the term nano, and I think you'll agree with me that if this is the scale of five nanometers. Each of these fibers is a nanofiber. Proteins, nucleic acids, intracellular organelles have been nanobiological structures eons before the term nano came to be a buzzword, a world of nanotechnology and nanoscience. But there's a lot of activity to develop nanorobots and look at the scale of the, in the artist's view between the nanobot and the red blood cell, which certainly is not a nanostructure. There's also a nano iPhone and even a nano car. And this gentleman is looking for the nanotechnology department only to be told that he just stepped on it. So clearly, nano is in the eye of the beholder. And when we, as scientists, use the term nano, we better be precise and define well what we're talking about. When it comes to nanomedicine, the, which is a world within nanoscience and nanotechnology, the uh, definitions are a bit tighter. I took your two definitions in the field, and I'd like to read out to you the second one. Nanomedicine is the science of technology of nanometric size scale complex systems seem to range from 1 to 1,000 nanometers. Now, if we ask a physicist, chemist, engineer, what's his vision of a nanoparticle, he'll tell you from just an atom to a particle which is a single digit nanometer in diameter. If you will ask someone in the biomed world, especially someone developing a drug carrier, he will use most of this range. Those that are stricter will say, well, a nanoparticle is up to 100 nanometer in diameter. Others will take this whole range. Now, there's a definition of different fields within nanomedicine. Analytical tools, nanoimaging, nanomaterials and nanodevices, novel therapeutics and drug delivery, clinical, regulatory, and toxicological issues. But these are not separate from one another. If you are going to develop another therapeutic, especially formulated in a drug carrier, you need analytical to tools all the way, from the start of development to quality assurance of the product. 
Nanoimaging is a very good tool in the course of developing and characterizing your nanocarrier. Uh, it can include nanomaterials, and obviously if you want to get it to the clinic, you have to address all these issues. Now, if you say nanomedicine, you mean the world, the arena. If you say a nanomedicine, then you're talking about something else. You're talking about the pharmaceutical product, nanomedicines in plural, of course. And I brought here just a small sample of nanomedicines in which the carrier is the nanocomponent, uh, liposomes of different types, uh, polyplexes, protein spheres, uh, different types of polymers, including an antibody. And there are many more drug carriers, nano drug carriers, as you'll hear about in this uh, summer school. And it's a good thing. We need a lot because there are many pathologies to treat. In each pathology, many drugs that need a targeted carrier. And there's a diverse patient population that uh, responds differently to different drug carrier formulations. But despite the arsenal of drug carriers, there are really two branches or two major types. In one, the carrier is a particle, and this is represented by the upper panel. In the other, the carrier is a polymer. Now, in the rest of my talk, if I'll say carrier, I mean something from both types. If I mean a specific either polymer or particle, I'll tell you. And I'm not going to get here into the pros and cons of each type of carrier. Uh, you'll hear a lot of it during the days from people that will present their uh, research. Uh, but I do like to point out a few things because it's relevant to the rest of my talk. So both polymers and particles can be biological entities, as is or with slight modification. They can be made from biological building blocks, from synthetic building blocks, a mixture of them. There is a wide list of possible materials, not an infinite list. One of the differences is how you load the drug into the carrier. When it's a particulate carrier, usually the drug is enclosed within by physical means, no chemical bond between the drug and any component of the carrier. When the carrier is a a polymer, the drug is usually bound covalently to a component of the carrier. Then other agents, targeting agents, which we'll talk about, agents endowing the carrier with other properties, can additionally to the drug be bound covalently either to the particle or the polymer. And the covalent bonding <coughs> is needed because if it won't be bound covalently when you put it in vivo, the targeting agent, the other agents may dissociate and you lose all these properties. And last but not least, sometimes the drug itself is the nanoparticle. And I have here two examples. One is iron oxide nanoparticles that if they are paramagnetic, either alone or enclosed in the carrier, can be used for diagnostics imaging by MRI. In addition, they are under investigation for a treatment of inflammation in cancer. A protein can be considered a nanodrug, but proteins can also be put in nanofibrillar form, as illustrated here for insulin, and then it's a nanodrug, and this can also be enclosed in the carrier. Usually, if the drug itself is a nanoparticle, then you might need to enclose it in a micro particle, not necessarily in a nanoparticle. So as with nano in general, when we're talking about nanomedicine, we have to precisely define and describe what we're talking about. Now, every time the proposal is on the table to replace treatment with free drug by treatment with that drug or a similar in a carrier, you complicate matters on any grounds you wish to view it. And I'll give you just a few examples. If the production of a drug in a carrier is much more complicated than just the drug itself, production of the drug itself. Meeting all the requirements of a pharmaceutical product with a formulation of a drug in a carrier is more complex than uh, just the drug itself. The biochemistry, biology, physiology of working with 
a drug in a carrier is more complicated than the drug alone, as is the response of the patients to the treatment. And making a formulation of a drug in a carrier is much more expensive than the free drug. So besides having fun in the lab with it, there has to be good justification for coming with a proposal of treating with a drug in a carrier formulation. And I'm sure the why of it you've been asked. Most of you have an answer, but for the sake of those that may not have an answer or to uh, increase the type of answer you can have, let's go over, over it briefly. So the needs for targeted drug delivery start with the reality in the treatment. Too often, treatment with free drug leads to poor therapeutic responses, treatment failures, <coughs> and poor safety. And this isn't a minor issue because the majority of approved drugs, whether over-the-counter or prescription, are formulations in which the drug is free. And at least in big pharma houses, the message that the carrier is important, even at the stage of development, hasn't gone through yet. The approach in many cases is still today, let's first develop the drug, get it approved, and then if there'll be need or we'll think we want to increase uh, the market by putting it in the carrier, then we'll worry about it. And we may be losing very good drugs on the way that would come to the clinic if they are formulated early enough in a carrier. The free drug deficiencies which lead to all of these, uh, which I'll specify in a moment, are widespread. They transcend the drug species, the pathology treated. It's not just chemotherapy and cancer. Uh, they transcend the route of administration and the dosage form. And these deficiencies can be divided into two sides of a coin. You put the free drug into a living system, it gets immediately diluted. Extensively if it's systemically, moderately or low if it's local. There's literally no self-targeting. And I'll talk about this a little more later on. So there's indiscriminate distribution of the drug within the living system. Free drugs get often cleared from the tissues from the body before enough got to the target to do the job. Free drugs are vulnerable to enzyme catalyzed degradation or other processes of inactivation along the route from administration to the site of drug action, which means in non-scientific terms that from each dose given, there's totally little active drug at the target and it stays there for too short a time to make a therapeutic impact from the dose. All of these or some of these severely diminish the therapeutic efficacy. The other side of the coin to which the lack of targeting is a big contributor are safety problems, adverse effects, toxicity, and undesirable immune responses. And if you say, well, if only a small share of the administered dose gets in active form to the target, let's increase the dose tenfold, a hundredfold. Let's increase the dosing frequency, both dose and uh, frequency. It's a very limited solution because uh, it aggravates all the safety problems. So these together are the res share responsibility for poor therapeutic responses, treatment failure, poor safety, and one of the basic ways and most extended to try and overcome these deficiencies is to formulate a drug in a targeted carrier. And if the carrier does its job, then efficacy and safety should be increased simultaneously. But to do the job, the drug carrier has to meet certain essential requirements. It has to provide mutual protection of the drug in the carrier and the biological environment from each other. The kinetics of drug release from the carrier should fit the requirements of the therapy and each therapy can have different requirements. The responsibility of drug targeting is delegated to the carrier. The carrier should stay at the target sufficient time to deliver all its drug load it should be stable on all aspects of stability from a pharmaceutical product to what happens in the body. And we want versatility so, so that 
a carrier platform can fit more than one drug. And in the interest of not replacing one set of problems by another, but offering a true solution, the carrier has to be biodegradable, not too fast. We want a window in time for the carrier with a drug in it to be administered, to get to the target, to release the drug, and then massive biodegradation to start. We want it to be biocompatible, no toxicity or low tolerable, um, no immunogenicity or low that will be tolerable. So now let's go into the big issue of drug targeting. And the theoretical definition is to deliver the administered drug exclusively to its site of action and nowhere else. In real life, it means to deliver the majority of the dose to the target and little elsewhere. And we need the carrier mediation for drug targeting for two reasons. First of all, most drugs are not capable of self-targeting. And those few that are, it doesn't always come into expression in the living system. And sometimes you put it inside a carrier for different reasons, such as an antibody that you want to protect from enzyme catalyzed degradation. And then the ability of the targeting is masked by its inclusion in the carrier. There are two essential but not sufficient requirements for carrier-mediated drug targeting. There are two partners in, the, partners in this business, a carrier and a receptor in its borderless term, a binding site which is sufficiently unique to the target. And between the two, there has to be recognition and high affinity binding. And it's essential, but it's not sufficient for the reason that the recognition and high affinity binding come into effect at close proximity. If you take the example of infusion of a drug carrier formulation all the way into the bloodstream and this is the target, the formulation first has to get close enough to the target for these two to come into effect. Now, I'd like to point out terminology used in the field and some duplicity. You've probably heard the term passive targeting, active targeting. What do they exactly mean? We have two types of passive targeting. Passive targeting is the case where the receptor recognizes and binds the carrier as is. You do not have to add to the ca carrier any targeting moiety. And you'll give, I'll show you an example later on. And this goes for any type of pathology. Passive targeting, the second uh, definition for something else, is for cancer therapy, and that's the enhanced permeability and retention effect, the EPR effect. Both of them were defined in the early, early to mid-80s, it's hard to say which was first, but again, when we talk about passive targeting, we have to define what we're talking about. Active targeting means that you have to equip and endow the carrier with a targeting moiety that will be recognized by the unique receptor to the target and bind to it with high affinity. An example that will run through the data examples I'll show you of a targeter and a receptor pair is when the targeter is hyaluronin and the receptor is the CD44 family, the natural receptor family for this molecule. So for those that are not maybe familiar with this molecule, uh, I'll introduce it. It's used to be called also hyaluronic acid. Uh, the prevailing name in the last decade or so is hyaluronin. It's a macromolecular polysaccharide with molecular weight of about one to 10 million Dalton. It's a very large molecule. And the examples of targeting I'll give you with it are only with a naturally occurring molecule, not with fragments in it. Why? We can talk about it at the uh, question session later on. It's a member of the glucosaminoglycan family, like heparin sulfate and others, but it's the only one that doesn't have a protein. It's only the polysaccharide 
and it's abundant in the living system from bacteria all the way to man. And because it's only the polysaccharides, there's no cross-species immunogenicity, and hyaluronin, for example, obtained by fermentation in bacteria has been approved for human use. It's made of deceptively simple of this disaccharide, N-acetyl glucosamine and glucuronic acid. In the naturally occurring material, this disaccharide is repeated 3,000 times and more. And it's non-toxic, non-immunogenic, biodegradable, and also acts as a cryoprotectant. So this is the targeting agent. What about the receptors? The hyaluronan receptors on cell membranes are the CD44 family. Cancer cells, many types of cancer and inflammatory cells have CD44 variants while the uh, normal regular cells have a version which is CD44S for standard, sometimes it's called H for homeostasis. The affinity of hyaluronin to the uh, CD44 variants is significantly higher than to the standard one. And in addition, the variants are in the composition ready for high affinity binding of hyaluronin, whereas the standard CD44 and normal cells usually is in a conformation which is not ready to bind hyaluronin at high affinity. So from both partners, this gives us a potential for targeting. Now I want to pose some questions and answer them, challenge them. In many publications, you may see the term homing to home unto as synonyms for targeting. Can we use them in carrier-mediated drug targeting? We can use them if we're talking about targeting weapons because you can equip a missile with sensors that will sense the target from thousands, hundreds of miles afar and home onto it. We can't use it for drug targeting, and I'm repeating it once more. The recognition and high affinity binding come into effect at close proximity. The drug in carrier formulation infused into the bloodstream cannot sense the target from afar and shoot directly to it. So targeting is the better term. Can drug targeting be studied in vitro in cell cultures? If you go into Google, for example, and you'll put as keywords for the search drug targeting, you'll drown in millions of items. If you use as keywords drug targeting and cell cultures or in vitro, you'll still drown in millions of items as if the problem of targeting has been solved, nothing left to do in it, and you can study targeting in cell cultures. Uh, it's a bit misleading. The problem of drug targeting in vivo, in a patient, or in an animal model is still a issue that has a lot of challenges in it, still a lot to do. And you cannot fully study drug targeting in vitro because we need the living system with its activity. We need to get it to the target close enough. You can only see it in the living system. So any study that says drug targeting in cell culture, look well what exactly has been done in that study. But there are elements of drug targeting that can be studied in the cell culture. The binding of the carrier to the cell, qualitative and quantitative, together with specificity of the receptor, can be studied in cell cultures. Internalization of the drug, whether alone or with a, the carrier, can be studied in vitro. An important thing that can be studied in vitro that is maybe already beyond the targeting per se is retention of the drug's therapeutic activity. Enclosing a drug by physical means in a particular carrier, binding a drug covalently to a polymer carrier is not a simple matter. And in the course of this process, drug activity may be compromised. So before going with the formulation into a living system, 
it's better to define and find out if the drug has retained at least most of its activity. And you can start studying carrier safety in a cell culture. That's not the ultimate. You have to do toxicity studies in the animal carrying the pathology, but you can start in the cell culture. And I'll go with you over each one of them. And we'll start with the binding receptor specificity and internalization. And I'll start with an example of binding of targeted carriers to mouse peritoneal macrophages, starting with a qualitative data from confocal microscopy. Now, I'm sure you all know that macrophages prefer microparticles over nanoparticles, that they bind in endocytose a multilamella liposomes, microprotein spheres, uh, latex particles, and many others, without the need to equip the carrier with the targeting moiety. And this is an example of one of the uh, things called passive targeting. The upper panel are regular liposomes with nothing on their surface. The liposomes are red. The green is the uh, cell membrane, the macrophage membrane. And if we'll start with a regular unilamella liposome, 100 nanometer diameter, a microparticle, you can barely see here and there red dots that bind to the uh, macrophages. If you, sorry, if you take a multilamella liposome, which is about one to two microns in diameter, you can see well the red of the liposomes uh, that were internalized by the macrophages. And to strengthen this uh, ability of the macrophage to recognize, bind, and internalize these liposomes, uh, the same experiment was done with internalization inhibitors. And if internalization is inhibited, indeed you see much less of these liposomes and only on the cell surface. The bottom panel is for a liposome either nano-sized, unilamellar, or micro-sized, or the upper edge of nano-sized, uh, depending if you are flexible or uh, strict, um, that have hyaluronin as the targeter on the surface, direct ag against the CD44 receptors on the cell of the macrophage. And these bind you can see the red on the outside a little better than the non-targeted ones. The targeted multilamella liposome, which could have gone like any other particle with the macrophages, binds, but it's not internalized. And I'll show you later on that it's not a bad thing. This is the qualitative view. The quantitative view, uh, which was done by thermodynamics of liposome macrophage binding with all these four systems shows that the targeted multilevel vesicle has the highest affinity to ma the macrophages. The regular uh, multilamella liposome has lower affinity and the smaller ones has still lower affinity. How was this affinity obtained? So let's go to thermodynamics of carrier cell binding and some common notions and terminology. I'm sure you've heard the terms specific binding and non-specific binding, whether it's a targeted or a carrier to a cell, an antibody to a cell, a hormone to a cell, or some proton to protein. And together with the specific and non-specific binding goes these notions. The carrier binds to the designated receptors in a saturating pattern, in the specific binding. In non-specific binding, the carrier binds to sites other than the designated receptors in a linear pattern. And I'm asking, is it so? And for that, let's go to the following. Carrier cell binding is a case within a whole world that is called multiple equilibria which is a binding between a large entity, a macromolecule, and the ligand, which is the smaller entity. In the uh, present case, 
the cell, target cell, acts as the macromolecule and the carrier as the ligand. And the principles of multiple equilibria are the following. Any type of ligand site bond can take place, including adsorption. It's also a type of bond. Just no covalent bonding because we are talking about an equilibrium process. This is just an example of a macromolecule. S is a site, and you can see that there are more than one type of site that a single macromolecule holds for the ligand. There's a few S1s here, S2, and S3. In each one of these sites, there could be one or more on the same macromolecule. So there are about two S1, uh, a few S2, about four of them, and three S3. The binding of the ligand to each type of site has its own equilibrium binding constant. This is the equation that describes it, and not to worry, I'm not going to go into heavy, thanks, into heavy mathematics. There are a few ways to write this equation. I brought the one that is uh, most uh, prevalent in biology. This is a saturation equation, and if it reminds anyone of the michaelis menten equation in biochemistry 101, it should, because that is a saturating pattern also, but these are completely different uh, situations. L is the concentration of the ligand, which would be the carrier in our case, remaining unbounded equilibrium, and B is the quantity of carriers bound per a given number of cells at this specific L. This, each term is for a specific type of binding sites, and we'll have in this summation many terms, as many types of binding sites that occur. In this example, it would be three terms of this equation in the summation. B max is the maximum number of carriers that can be bound to the cell at a given type of site when all those sites of that given type are saturated. And this is the dissociation equilibrium constant of the carrier from its spe specific site, which gives us the affinity. The Bmax gives us the capacity and the KD, the affinity. Uh, the lower the KD, the higher the affinity. And if you have good B and L experimental values, you can use typical software of nonlinear regression analysis in your computer in order to extract the number of terms, the Bmax and the KD of each type of binding site. Now, where did this linear notion of nonspecific binding uh, come from? So this is an example of B versus L, the number of bound uh, carriers or other ligand versus L. Same cell line, same carrier under different experimental conditions, and this one looks saturating, and this one looks pretty linear. But if you do an experiment or these experiments and go to higher L values, notice this is 0 0.05 and this is 1, you get higher B values. This is about tenfold higher, and this one that looked linear starts showing the curvature for saturation. So there isn't linear and nonlinear binding. They are all saturating patterns. It depends just how far we go in the, with the L. Sometimes, for practical reasons in a study, we can't go far enough and we stay in this situation. So I would say there's no specific and nonspecific binding in terms of thermodynamics. There is stronger binding and weaker binding. And the specific is kind of in the eye of the beholder because we usually want to look at binding only to the receptor. A few examples from the data. This is a human colon cancer cell line. 
binding of a targeted carrier for which this cell line has specific receptors. The points are experimental. This is the binding when the receptors are available. And that equation I show you falls into this one. And I can talk about this more later on in the question period. But if the receptors are blocked and are not available to the ligand, we see not the highest binding, but the second or maybe third also types of sites the cell has for these. And up to here, it looks linear, but you can also see that it starts to curve. This is an example where there are two binding sites, although the equation, the pattern looks to the eye as if it's just one type of binding site. But if you analyze the data according to the equation, you see that there are actually two types of sites here, and you can extract the KD values, and you can see that there's a big difference between them. The Binding to the first site has a much smaller KD, which means higher affinity than that. And the capacity of the lower affinity is higher, more sites per cell than the, uh, more, uh, the, the higher binding. And this is something that happens a lot. Uh, not necessarily always, but in many cases, the second uh, binding, the third binding that are weaker in KD, the cell has many more sites for it. The last example I want to show you is a third uh, cancer cell line the, and liposomes that have a targeting agent for a receptor on the cell line. If we use the control of non-targeted liposomes, you can see that it's weaker binding, but it does come into saturation. If we use the targeted liposomes, then we have a lot more binding, a lot more sites. So far for binding that can well be studied in a cell culture. Next thing that can be studied in cell culture is the retention of the drug's therapeutic activity. And we usually compare the free drug to what the drug in the carrier does. But such studies are not necessarily evidence for advantage of the drug carrier formulation over a non-targeted carrier or over the free drug because such studies are heavily biased in favor of the free drug. It settles on the cell. It's there for the duration of the experiment, something that would never happen in vivo. So if you are testing your new drug carrier with a drug in it, in a cell culture compared to the free drug, and you see that the free drug is better, or that it's similar to your carrier drug formulation, not to be discouraged. The true test is in vivo. And I'll give you two examples. Uh, one is in vitro retention of anti-inflammatory activity. The cells are mouse peritoneal macrophages activate to mimic inflammatory macrophages. The measure is a pro-inflammatory cytokine TNF-alpha, which this is the 100% here, cells that secrete this pro-inflammatory uh, cytokine. The treatment is with a drug called dexamethasone. You've probably heard about it, a corticosteroid, certainly a drug that needs a targeted carrier. And the data are for the therapeutic effect, meaning reducing the uh, secretion of TNF-alpha by free drug, drug in the regular multilamellar liposomes, which to remind you are endocytosed by the uh, macrophage, and the same drug in the targeted multilamellar liposomes that bind strongly to the surface of the macrophage but are not internalized. Two doses of the, different doses of the drug and you can see that at low dose uh, maybe the targeted liposome uh, is significantly better than the control. Uh, these are not. If we go to a higher dose, both the free drug and the two types of liposomes uh, give the therapeutic effect. 
but we don't see much difference between the free drug and the liposomal drugs in this case. We do see what we want to see in such an experiment, retention of the therapeutic activity of the drug in the carrier, which means there's a chance it'll work in vivo. The second example is in vitro retention of anti-cancer drug activity. The drug is a chemotherapy, mitomycin C. It's formulated in regular and targeted nanocarriers because as you'll see later on, uh, we need the nanocarriers if you want to put it in vitro and not to be taken up by macrophages. This is cell demise, the percent of dead cells. And the 24 means the experiment was done as usual. You give the uh, formulations to the cells in the dish or in the plate, wait 24 hours later, remove it, and determine cell viability. And this, as I've already said, really heavily skews it in favor of the free drug. To be a little closer to what will happen in vivo, the, the free drug at the same dose won't get to the target, won't stay there as long as the targeted carrier. There's another experiment here, listed 424. That means the treatment was for four hours, everything washed, whatever free drug got into the cells got. Uh, targeted carriers, if they're bound strongly to the cells, some of it will stay despite the washing, wait 20 more hours, and then uh, determine cell viability. And let's start with the results and look first at the yellow, which is the 424 experiment. Free mitomycin C caused uh, under 10% cell death. This is free drug, but is, it is suspended in a, it's dissolved in a suspension of drug-free uh, regular non-targeted carriers. This will tell us if the carrier does anything by itself, good or bad, and it, it allows the drug to do its job. And you can see that the drug-free carrier has no effect, which is a good thing. It's almost the same. This is the free drug dissolved in the suspension of the targeted carriers. It's still under 20% diff. This is the uh, mitomycin C loaded inside the non-targeted carrier. And it's not too much different than the free drug. It floats around in the uh, solution above the cells. And this is the mitomycin C loaded in the targeted carrier, and you can see that you get much better cell kill than all the others. So here is an example that these experiments, beyond showing that the uh, drug has retained its activity, already show some advantage to the uh, targeted system. The last element of carrier-mediated drug targeting that can be studied in cell culture is safety. And again, I say it's just the beginning. You have to go in vivo also. And this is an example of a hyaluronin-targeted carrier in different cell line, a macrophage cell line, a human breast cancer, a larval line of human breast cancer, and a line of human ovarian cancer. And you can see that all of them give about 100% cell viability. So all of these is stuff that you can study in cell cultures, but it's not the complete targeting. And we can study targeting, the elements of targeting, as I've shown you, in a cell culture just with a carrier without a drug. We can also study in vivo, and I'll show you soon, a carrier targeting without the drug. But ultimately, in the effort to target the carrier, we should never forget the drug, which means this is what should happen. The carrier should get to the target with the majority of its drug load inside, rather than something like this, where the carrier arrived at the target empty because it's lost all the drug on the way from administration to the site of drug action. 
Let's look now at the steps we have to take in order to target a drug carrier formulation in a living system. If we administer it systemically, and a lot of carriers are administered into the bloodstream, the first step can be said targeting at the organ level, which is from the site of administration to the anatomic location where the pathology resides. I'll give you an example. If we want to treat bacterial infection in the lungs and we administer the formulation intravenously, it first has to get to the lungs. Second step is targeting at the cellular level. A within the relative anatomic location to get the drug carrier formulation as close as possible to the molecular site of drug action. And keeping to the same example of bacterial infection in the lungs, once the formulation is in the lungs, it has to get as close as possible to the bacterial uh, colonies. There's also an option to administer locally. We don't always have to administer it systemically. A, for example, if instead of intravenous administration with the target the lungs, we can administer it by aerosol, by inhalation directly to the lungs. And in that case, you can say we either achieved by choosing the local administration already the second step, or we circumvented it. Depends on the way you wish to view it. And in many cases, getting here, getting the targeted system close enough to the uh, pathology to be treated is sufficient because it's close enough that the recognition and binding will take place. There are some, some cases when we need a third step, and this is to get the drug that works, drugs that work inside the cell uh, internalized. And here is another question I want to raise, because many times there's this notion that you have to internalize the drug carrier formulation into the cell to get the drug inside the cell. And is it really always desirable or necessary? So internalization of drug carrier formulation, yes or no? No. Irrespective of whether the drug is small or large, whether the carrier is a polymer or a particle, if the site of drug action is on the cell membrane, outside the cell, because if it will be internalized, we actually are losing the drug for the therapy. Yes, we need internalization for drugs that operate inside the cell that are bound covalently to the carrier in the case of polymer drugs, because if this is the drug and the bond this is usually cleaved or something is activated to cleave it inside the cell. If the carrier is a particle with a drug physically held inside, whether internalization of this whole stuff is needed, yes or no, depends on the situation. And to illustrate the situation, let's look at pathways of drug supply to target cells for drugs that operate inside the cell and are delivered by a particular carrier. There could be a carrier that is internalized going through this whole endosome pathway. At the end, disruption of the particle and all the drug is released at once into the cell. There are therapies for which this pace will be required. The internalization process of the carrier is relatively fast. You can find numbers from half an hour to just a few hours and there are therapies that would require drug release all at once. If the carrier is of the type that binds and stays as a depot and is not internalized, uh, the drug itself with time will diffuse out of the carrier into the cell and this can take days and this is good for cases where we want drug supply from each dose for a long time, slow release. So coming back to this question for particulate carriers, internalization, we need it or not, depending on the desired rate of drug supply for the designated therapy. And this is for small molecules, for large molecules operating inside the cell. I would say the jury is still out if we really need internalization or get by without it. Because when all is said and done, 
for the therapy, it's the drug that we want inside the cell. And last on this issue, really getting hard evidence that a particulate carrier wasn't or was internalized is not easy. And too many times evidence that the drug got into the cell is taken as evidence that the whole drug carrier got into the cell. It's not necessarily true and it's not necessarily needed as long as the drug gets to its site of action. So what strategies can we apply when we go into a living system and we want to target our drug by targeting the carrier? And I'm dividing it into passive and active targeting. And the active targeting I'm talking about is the case where the receptor recognizes the carrier without any need for targeting agents and binds it with or without internalization. Such cases are when the site of drug action is within the reticular endothelial system. I'm sure you know what it is, but these are components of the reticular endothelial system a drug carrier introduced into the bloodstream will encounter. And to afford this targeting, we have to do what is very difficult for people to do, not interfere, do nothing. Let the reticular endothelial system do its job. We can aid and abet it by loose packing of the carrier, if we're talking about liposomes or other lipid-based particles. And we can aid it if it's large particles and if we promote by something on the carrier its opsonization. This is the strategy for passive targeting. If we need active targeting for a systemically administered system, when the sites are outside the RES, the strategy is built of two parts. We need to delay the uptake by the RES so it won't take it fast out of the circulation, give the drug carrier formulation enough time to circulate and each, part, each time it passes through the target, some of it can be uh, access the target and bind there. And for that, of course, we have to equip the carrier with the targeting agent. We know a lot throughout the years about how to delay uptake of particulate carriers from the circulation. And uh, we first need for it a small particle that's based on a really large multitude of studies done since the early 70s and on. Just to remind you, binding affinity for macrophages is much higher to microparticles than nanoparticles. So if we make them nano, it's they won't be taken up uh, by the macrophages and fast taken out of circulation. And we need also a hydrophilic coat rich with hydroxyl residues. This is the fruit of a lot of experiment at the phenomenal level. Examples of glycolipids, polyinositol, uh, which is another lipid in uh, liposomes and lipid-based particles, the famous polyethylene glycol, in liposomes and many other carriers. Hyalurona, as I've shown you, has a lot of hydroxyl residues, and there are others uh, that can endow the carrier with a coat rich with hydroxyl residues. And let's look at these one to one. So small particles, do we know what is the upper limit of small particles uh, that their delay it will be delayed in uptake from the circulation. Is it just 100 nanometers, 300, 1,000? We don't really know yet. The hydrophilic coat rich with hydroxyl residues. What are the lower and upper limits of hydroxyl surface density? We still don't know yet. There's data for a specific systems, but not something systematic. What is the optimal combination of size and hydroxyl density? We also don't know yet. And what role does carrier rigidity play in all of this? Uh, we also don't know it completely. Now I'd like to give you two examples from the field of active targeting 
in a living system. The first example is active targeting in mice and pigs that have undergone myocardial infarction and there's inflammation in the heart and the study was done for the targeting with drug-free targeted liposomes. The target cells, inflammatory cells in the inflamed heart are macrophages. I'll show you an example for the inflamed heart in another case of inflamed aorta in atherosclerosis. The targeted carrier is hyaluronin liposomes, the multilamella liposomes, the larger ones. You already know that the two partners are hyaluronin as a targeter and CD44 as a receptor. And this is from a joint study with the Jonathan Lior group and my group. This is the inflamed heart. The liposome has a red fluorescing lipid in it. This is six hours after intravenous administration, three days after the event of the myocardial infarction. And you can see in the heart the red of the targeted liposomes. And this is just a blow up. And the carrier accumulated preferentially in the MI heart. And it didn't go elsewhere because these are the two parts of targeting. It has to go to the target and it shouldn't go elsewhere. So this is the same picture of the heart in the MI mouse with the liposomes that got there. But you can see here liver, spleen, lungs are free of the carrier. It didn't get there. Uh, this is again the inflamed heart. This is a sham. So there's no inflammation here. So the liposome didn't get to the heart. And this is just a saline control. This is a pig uh, three days after the MI event. The uh, diagnostic system here is iron oxide nanoparticles that give a signal in the MRI in the targeted multilamella liposomes taken two days after the administration. And you can see here in the heart the uh, liposomes. This is the MRI picture. You can also see the iron by histology staining for iron. And if we look at other organs of this AMI pig, kidneys, liver, spleen, lungs, they are clear of the uh, liposomes. This is the case of a atherosclerotic mice that has strong inflammation in the aorta. And you can see that the liposomes given intravenously got there. And they didn't get to the liver, kidneys, and this is just a saline control. So these are examples that you can get truly active targeting in a living system, looking at the uh, drug-free carrier. And of course, it has to be uh, verified at least indirectly with a drug in the carrier. And the second example of targeting I'll show you is a, a, a chemotherapeutic drug encapsulated in a tumor targeted liposome. Uh, the target owner is a tumor. These are the hyaluronan liposomes, but this time small ones because we want to evade quick uptake by the reticular endothelial system, and the same two partners, hyaluronin and CD44. These are lung tumors. And first of all, this is to demonstrate the lung circulation. So this is the concentration of the drug in the blood. It's the same chemotherapy, mitomycin C, that I've shown you that its activity is retained in vitro in the liposomes. Free drug disappears very fast from the circulation. This is time in hours. If we put the drug in a small regular liposome with no targeting, but it's a small particle, so it gets out or is taken out of circulation uh, slower than the free drug. But if we have it in the targeted carrier that also has hydroxyl residues on the surface, then we get a much longer retention in circulation. To see the targeting, uh, we've looked at the biodistribution in different organs. 
six hours after administration, intravenous administration, and this is the percent injected dose per gram tissue at different organs. Free mitomycin C is green, mitomycin C in non-targeted liposomes is black, mitomycin C in the targeted liposomes is red. All this data here is for the tumor-bearing mice. You can see that the accumulation in the spleen and kidneys is small and it's almost the same irrespective of the formulation. In the liver, the lowest accumulation in this case is with the targeted carrier, higher with the non-targeted, and higher with the free drug. And if we look at the tumors in the lung, if the lungs, which is the target, the free mitomycin C, about a percent got there. In the non-targeted carrier, about 6-7% and in the targeted carrier, about 25%. And if we do the same type of experiment, but in healthy mice that don't have tumor anywhere, and again administer either the free drug in the non-targeted or in the targeted carrier, you can see that very little got in the, uh, into the lungs and uh, no difference among the different formulations. Now, when I asked the question of why do we need to have a targeted drug carriers instead of free drug. It was in order to increase efficacy and safety. And the question is, does it do it? And you'll hear in the course of this uh, summer school, I hope a lot of examples that will be success stories saying it can do it. And I'm adding here something from our studies. First, looking at safety. This is a subacute toxicity study in healthy mice. This is the starting point. It's not the whole top study that you have to do. The mice got three injections of 10 milligrams per kilogram body of mitomycin C in different formulations on days 0, 7, 14, 21, and 28, so five injections intravenous. And the follow-up of the toxicity is the body weight. This panel is, first of all, control of mice that got only cell line. It's over 30 days. They grow up. They increase their weight. That's the normal thing. But if they get the injections of the free drug, you can see its toxicity. There is a tremendous loss of body weight. If we give them drug-free non-targeted uh, small liposomes, or if we give them drug-free non-targeted unilamellar vesicles, unilamellar liposomes, uh, if there's no drug inside, the liposomes don't do anything. They are similar to cell line, so they're not toxic by themselves. If we put the drug in the non-targeted liposomes or in the targeted liposomes, it mitigates to a significant extent the toxicity of the drug. It hasn't abolished the toxicity. It's, as I said, just the start of the study, but it's in the direction of the ability of the drug carrier formulation to improve the safety. The second example is of does it improve efficacy? The model here is a lung metastatic disease or lung lesions. In mice, the mice get three injections to the tail vein at days one, five, and nine from the start of the uh, metastasis. And one way to monitor it is at a certain point in time from treatment, and this is at 21 days from tumor uh, inoculation, to sacrifice the animals and look at the lungs, and you can uh, count the number of metastases. You can also weigh the lungs because the lungs that carry tumors will weigh much more than normal mice from the same age, strain, and so forth that are healthy. And this is the measure so shown here. If the tumor-bearing mice got just saline, you can see that their lung weight increased 300 350% over 
the weight of a normal lung, which is around 200 uh, grams. 200 milligrams, sorry. If you give free mitomycin C, it reduces it a bit, but still the lungs are full of tumor. If you give the drug in the non-targeted liposomes, it again reduces a bit the uh, uh, tumors in the lung, but not a lot. But if you give it in the targeted carrier, it reduces the tumor burden so that the lung weight is not so much different from the uh, lung of the healthy mice quite significantly. I'd like to remind you these types of experiments are not to cure the cancer. These types of experiments are to see if the drug carrier formulation in the targeted carrier does better than free drug in other controls. Another way to look at it is at the survival of these mice. And those that got just saline, they are all dead by day 20. Those that got free mitomycin C, free drug, are all dead by day 25. Those that got uh, the drug in a non-targeted carrier are all dead by day 40. And those that got the drug in the targeted carrier live up to more than day 80. So I think it's time to conclude and leave a lot of time for questions and for resting. On the background of another, another nano something, if you have a moment of leisure and you haven't done it, I recommend that you go into a search engine, Google for example, and use nano art as your search term. And you'll be exposed to a lot of beautiful questions, a lot of beautiful pictures really pleasing to the eye. This is just one of them. So I hope I gave you a glimpse into global view of nanomedicine and nanomedicines, uh, including basic concepts and principles, that I've convinced you of what needs to be done and what should be done in carrier-mediated drug targeting, and then you can actually achieve it. Uh, I went beyond that into retention of activity and into uh, the drug carrier formulation really improving efficacy and um, safety with examples from experimental data. And we challenged a bit, at least I did, some of the dualism's myths and terminology in the field. Now, by the end of the fifth day of this uh, summer school, some of you may start thinking, so much has been done already. And there is a lot of success. What's left for me to do? So, not to worry. To repeat what I've said at the beginning, we, there, is, there are a lot of pathologies to treat. In each pathology, a lot of drugs that really cry out for a targeted carrier and a very wide patient population that responds differently even to the same uh, car drug carrier formulation. So there's lots more to do, which we hope this summer school will give you another push in order to go into the field and be innovative while doing good science. So I'll close with that, and I'll be happy to answer questions. I'll answer in a minute. I just want to point out uh, I'll be around most of the days of the summer school, so those that want to ask questions who might think of a question later on, uh, you will have the opportunity to do it. And uh, you can email me during the summer school, after the summer school, with questions, and I'll be happy to answer. Yes? Scratch, at least my approach is to be pathology driven, which means you want to develop a 
drug in a carrier formulation in order to treat a given pathology and you choose the drug that either is known in free form to uh, be used to treat that pathology with problems, the problems I've shown you with free drug, or maybe a new drug. And uh, if you are a lab that has your one carrier that you try for many different drugs, the first thing would be to formulate that drug in the carrier. And I'll give you the example from what we do in my lab, which is a particular carrier. We have three different uh, technologies of drug carrier. Uh, two can be made nano and micro, one only micro. So we'll choose the carrier or carriers to start with according to how it will be administered. Then you start with simple physical chemistry, which is to encapsulate the drug in the carrier and see what's the efficiency of encapsulation. You want to have the encapsulation efficiency as high as possible in a therapeutically relevant dose range. And if you start with two different carriers and one gives you a better answer, or one you can uh, maneuver more in changing components, say lipids, in order to achieve the high encapsulation, that's the one you pick. Second thing would be, if it's a small drug, to follow the rate of drug release. Because if it's released too slow, if it takes half-life of releases, let's go wild, 20 days, then at the competition, for example, of the cancer cells proliferating, the inflammatory situation getting worse, you won't be supplying enough drug in this competition. On the other hand, if once you put the drug carrier in the living system, uh, all the drug leaks out within 20 minutes, it's not different from administering a free drug. So you have to do that. Once you have a formulation, then you go into the in vitro situation uh, to see if really the targeting agent does its job in all the things I went through the binding, the retention of activity, toxicity at the cell culture level. If you are lucky and you get a system that uh, has done well in the in vitro state, then you go into the animal model study. So at least that's our approach. This is the systematic way. Uh, but some people either stay at the um, cell culture level or do only the in vivo or actually um, synthesize components for drug carriers. Everything is kosher. You can do everything. It depends on your approach and point of view and what interests you. But ultimately, you have to have the whole way. Yes? that ultimately since the goal is to treat patients, you have to get to studies in an animal model. But there are many ways that before that you can characterize and study your system. So it can be done, but it doesn't, at least in my opinion, uh, come instead of uh, in vivo studies in an animal model of the pathology you want to treat. Yes. Um, I was wondering if um, in the example you showed with the large, um, the large liposomes, 
and the information model. Um, if you have an idea, if you think that your carrier actually goes to micro is that then like recruited to the information side, or are they like taken up at the side of the picture? Do you think what is more likely, or is there like a way to test this? A way to test? Well, well it point. can be both. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want to uh, test whether the um, phagocytic cells in circulation uh, have already taken up, uh, you can take out, you, you have to have a good probe to identify and quantitate your uh, drug carrier formulation in the blood, but you can take out blood samples and see what happens. Yes. Uh, thank you for this talk. Do you think that the regulatory approval should be more strict for uh, nanoparticles than small molecular drugs? And if you think so, why? The increase in terms of uh, approving a drug carrier formulation, and I'll uh, give us an example just that for which I have some information, the uh, regulatory American uh, agency, the FDA, uh, I can tell you that when the first drug liposome uh, system was, uh, they asked for approval to go into uh, clinical studies, and that's the famous doxyl that you'll hear about. Um, among liposomologists, if I can use that term, uh, the hope was that it will go as a device because it was an approved generic already drug in, uh, just in a carrier and the FDA said no. A veteran drug in a new carrier, a new formulation is a new drug entity and it had to go through all these uh, stages. And of course, since it was a new thing, in a sense, the regulatory authority had themselves to define what they really want to see in this. Uh, I think they are strict enough, uh, but I think all of us from the side of uh, should, God forbid, will be patients that need such a system. We want them to be as strict as possible in terms of the safety. But what? The regulatory framework was... No, I think it's strict enough. enough. Yes. Okay. Now, I'm talking about medications. I'm not talking about food or any other thing that uh, plants and so forth, because I just don't know about it, but about nanomedicines. Yes? Uh, I'm not sure if you, if you showed uh, for how many days did you treat it, the mouse? How many days did you treat the mouse? This was a targeting. It oh, wasn't treatment. It was after a day or how long? It was in a model of atherosclerosis in a mouse. Uh, to the best of my recollection, six hours post ejection of the, uh, of the targeted carrier. Such studies are um, currently done, so I don't have an example, but you do it step by step. You first see if it really got to the target, and then you continue this experiment. This is why I made it clear at the beginning that I'm not showing you a whole study from start to end, just picked a few examples to demonstrate the issues I talked about. in general, how 
how is how does it work in Israel? And is it more like the European system or the American system? Israel is, of course, too small to be a single market. So uh, when you develop a pharmaceutical agent, three drug or drug in a carrier, you, uh, from the start, look at the uh, regulatory in the States, and I think recently, not only in the United States, but also in Europe.